Tennessee All right. Yeah. We're back, back at Lake Fort Marina. And I brought the, I brought the heavy hitter, <laughs> the old legend, Mr. Pac-Man. Sorry, thank you yes, for coming and joining us. Uh, we appreciate that. And a little bit lighter crowd tonight. We got our schedule off because of that big tournament last week. I think yeah. there's some people that maybe are off, but we're here on Friday. What's the date today? You might know. 29. We're here on September 29th, 28th. 28th, Friday night. And we'll be back in two weeks. So if you want to attend these, we'll be back two weeks from September 28th. We'll be at 6 p.m. Lake Fort Marina every other Friday night. Really want to say thank you to them also when you're coming by. Get on over at Tiffany's. They got a little prime room special that goes on on Friday night. You know anything about that? Oh, yeah. I think I talked him into that. We, <laughs> you came up your idea? I think we both know plenty about right. the prime rib special. It's it. worth the trip alone, even not listening to us no. level So get up here for that. And Mark, I'm going to kind of let you kick us off. I know you know what's going on just as good or better than anybody else. You've got all the years of experience and arguably have probably caught more giants out of this lake than anybody that's ever fished it. So uh, what's going on on Lake Fork, man? Well, the lake right now is kind of in transition period. You know, the we had our first major cold front this past weekend. Yes, we did. And that's going to cause the lake to start turning over. Mm -hmm. And the way you can tell, you just see them brown bubbles out there on the main lake. But the good news is, uh, you can still catch them up in the creeks because the lake doesn't turn over, you know, shallower than about 15 foot, it doesn't turn over. So, yeah. just go up in the creeks and look for them white <coughs> herons and the gray herons. They'll kind of tell you where the shad are. And that's the number one key right now is finding the shad. You put more value on one versus the other on white and gray? <laughs> gray is probably the number one. Yeah, I'm the same way. But sometimes when you don't see gray, you look for the white ones. Uh, but the gray ones are the, big, the ones you want to look for. If you yeah. see both, definitely pay more attention. That's, yeah. a, that's why I ask you because that's yeah. what I do. So. Yeah, the gray. So, uh, and there's several ways you can catch them. But right now, they're feeding on a lot of them. are feeding on smaller shad up in them creeks. Mm -hmm. So you want to throw smaller baits like... We've been catching them on small uh, top waters, uh, choker style bait, and fish them kind of fast, but not too slow. Just keep them moving on top, and uh, that's been my number one deal. Uh, just top waters. So. And then I'm catching some on buzz baits early and stuff, smaller buzz baits, not the big ones. Yeah. But any kind of baits like that. Then when they kind of slow down, just kind of slow down. Fish smaller worms, Texas rig worms. Still throwing a big ten inch. You want to throw about a seven inch worm. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you know, we've had uh, really good luck on actually one of your baits doing when, when yeah. that time comes. Yeah, Chad, I've been throwing my shad some too. Throwing that weightless around some of that grass yeah. up in them creeks has been yep. good for us. And then, you know, our our number one moving bait that's been the most consistent has been a, a little three and a half inch swim bait with a little yep. tiny blade yep. underneath it. Yep, yep. Just trying to mimic the same deal, trying yep. to mimic that little bait. Yep, yep, yep. yep. Been pretty good. And if any of you guys have any questions during this, just come on with them we'll be happy to answer them yeah so uh what do you i mean how long does this look so we got the lake turning over so you're the ultimate offshore guy i mean i you know i don't ever see you leaving the main lake hardly ever very rarely and, and i noticed you've been i've seen you those i think it's yesterday i saw you on the water fishing the back of some of them creeks like yeah. i was and um how long do you usually stick to that shallow pattern before you start going back out to your, your bread and butter usually it'll get better about the third week of october and then end of november it'll be really kicking deep you need the water temperature to cool way down because uh, the hotter it is the more oxygen the bass need and right. when it turns over and they don't have that much oxygen and it's till the water's warm that's what shuts them down right. so when that's we start getting more cold front starts cooling down we need to get cold quick now to get to get turn over quick and to get these fish fired back up so because if it's going to a lot of times what we'll do is warm back up in the 90s 80s 90s for two or three weeks that's the worst thing that can happen yeah because it'll just bring it on out another two weeks. That's kind of what we just came to. It was like yeah. 100 degrees last week, yeah. and then it cooled down and got in. So if we'll get a good front every week, yeah. uh, you know, another two, three weeks, it, it'll be back on deep. Yeah. So. Okay. Cool, man. So how cool, when you say you need to cool down, like in the... The main lake needs to get down in the upper 60s, low 70s. The shad will typically move out out of the creeks at 60 degrees because they're they're not going to live after 55 degrees. So the, when it gets when the nights get down to 60 degrees, those shad are going to start heading out. Yeah. What happens is, uh, see, right now shad need more oxygen than bass do. They're the first ones to move in the creeks when it turns over. Mm -hmm. Yep. Or uh, oh, they'll move up on the point shallow. So they're they're loaded in there right now in the creeks them shad. But when, it, like he said, when it starts getting cold again, they'll start moving back out, and that's when my bite will get good again. 
and that that's usually end of October, first of November. That's kind of what I always tell people. The peak, you know, for me, it's always been the peak fall bite on Lake Fork. If you just put a general term on it, you know, just try to pick the best time. It, it, it can vary a little bit depending on the weather patterns and all that. But October fifteenth, Thanksgiving seems to always be in yeah. that period right there. Yeah. You're going to have it's going to start getting better. It's going to peak, and then it's by the time you get Thanksgiving, it'll start kind of going more into a winter deal, slowing yeah. down. So that yeah. kind of seems to be the yeah. yearly routine out here. Anyway, yeah. of course. Yeah. It's never bad to fish Lake Fork because there's so many big fish here. Yeah. You know, even when it's turning over, the bites can be harder to get by. You have to be a little more thorough, a little more methodical about how you fish. Even on the moving baits, you sometimes you got to make repeated casts where there's fish at to get bit and all that stuff. But there's big fish that move into that shallow water that you can catch during the turnover because they're up there and they're kind of in a vulnerable area yep. in less water column, less place to hide, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as they get out on the offshore structure, that's great. Then when they come out of that and go to winter, you know, creek channel beds, we go get us yeah. a jig, don't yeah, we? That's right. Usually after Christmas is when I start flipping a jig on the yeah. channel beds. Yeah. That's usually yeah. when I start. But you can catch them, you know. Don't be talking dirty to me now. I get all excited. You start talking about flipping uh, that jig. That's right. <laughs> that's probably my favorite way to catch them, oh, believe God, it or not. That's so but much fun. That's, it is. You won't get a whole bunch of bites, but the ones you catch are big ones. So. Well, cool, man. That's awesome. It's, uh, Never a bad time to come late for it, especially when you go this cat right here because he don't show it too much when there's people around looking, but when you get him alone in the boat, he's about the funniest person I've ever <laughs> That's where the good jokes come out. <laughs> well, it helps. This time of year, you don't have, you have more grass in the creeks, so the lake doesn't water up as much, uh, muddy up as much as it does in the spring. Because the spring there's not much grass and that mud just flows through, that grass kind of filters it out and they're not, they don't get muddied up. So you can catch them. And, uh, but, uh, but that water flow, it'll help push, kind of push that turnover cycle. And, and what it does, it brings that fresh water in mm -hmm. up in them creeks and, it, and, it, and it's cooler. And that's why, them, that's why it's just so much better to stay in them creeks during the turnover because you're getting that fresh water in. The water cools down cooler at night. But the cold water gives more oxygen. Yeah, it's more oxygen to the chatter in there. I mean, it, that's the place to be right now in them creeks. It, it just is. You you picking up a frog at all on some of that grass, man? We threw that? a frog uh, some today, and yesterday customer caught one on a frog today, and he caught one yesterday on a frog. But like I said, he caught three or four on a buzz bait this morning, and he caught five or six on that. Uh, Dual Realis chugger, small chugger bait like a pop bar. Mm -hmm. But he cut probably the most on it. And then this afternoon we went deep. What? But before we went deep, we flipped a little in the creek channels up here. He's, like I said, he cut that 80, about an 80 pound Opelousa flathead. That thing was huge, man. <laughs> no, tell me how you told me earlier. Come on, hey. that was great. He flipped the jig down in there. I told him flip a flip. There's a lay down <laughs> next to the creek drop. He works it through there. He, he said he got a good thunk, man. Yeah. He said so, and that rod bows up, and it likes it hangs him up. And that fish swim out of there, I guess. But it, he fought that thing for 15, 20 minutes. Yeah. I, we pulled the boat in the middle of the creek, John, just take your time with him. Yeah. <laughs> he got it up, that, that, that fish was as long as he was. Yeah. And his head was that wide. I mean, it was a giant. You said you went to net him, just the head, the tail was yeah. just sticking out. Yeah, I went to net him, and the, <laughs> the net broke. All we get in that net was his head. <laughs> we left him up. We got him in the boat finally. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Mark Pack will put you on giants of some sort yeah. when you come fishing with him. <laughs> he had a 50 pound scale in the boat that bottomed it out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, he picks that fish up and he's like, dude, this is heavier than a 50 pound bag of feed. I said, yeah, he's about 80 pounds. That thing was huge, man. God, I couldn't believe he caught that thing. Yeah, how he got that in the boat out of that timber, that's crazy. Uh -huh. What kind of line do you use? Because that's some good stuff. Yeah, he was using <laughs> Mark, when you said after after a while you went out deep, what do you call them deep? I went down the dam where I, there's a lot of fish down there. They're just hard to catch. But we did manage to catch two of them out there. It was like 20, it was a drop from 25 to 28. Okay. They were sitting there. And he pulls up. Second cast catches one. Fish her another out, not a bite. So we go to the next spot, throws out there on his third cast, catches another one. I said, well, it's time to leave. Yeah, <laughs> so it's one by deal. Yeah. One it's problem. like a one spot deal, but yeah. there, were, there were some big ones down there. We just couldn't get them to react to another. Yeah. And usually when that happens, fish as slow as you can, because yeah. them fish ain't moving much. Just 
throw that Carolina rig out there and drag it real slow. Just kind of stop. Five, yeah. ten seconds. Almost dead sticking. Just dead sticking. Yeah. And same way with the drop shot. You can just throw it over and just let it sit there. Yeah. And basically just fish as slow as you can. That's right. That's right. Yep. What, what bait are you throwing on the Carolina rig? I'm throwing my five inch impact shad. Deep. I'm throwing that chartreuse pepper. Oh, okay. I can just see it good deep. Usually when I get shallower, say 18, 15, 18, I switch to it like a green color watermelon been throwing that watermelon red magic that you yeah. had it's been the one we were throwing the most yeah. of them in grass. yeah that's a good one yeah good. one thing i want to ask you about and, I, and i'll kind of go through a little brief synopsis of kind of something that i look for and i want to hear your thoughts or your opinions on it i think it'll be a good topic is when we come out of this turnover time and we start looking back offshore you know mid late october mm -hmm. it, to me it seems to be a certain type of structure that, that I found that seems to hold the fish a little better than others, and, and it, it can be anything. It can be a pond name, a point, a roadbed, but the shape of it's always kind of the same. And, and it seems to be this long, skinny, flat spot. You know, whether and it's not these big, broad points that spread out real wide, but these long, narrow points that have a long, skinny, flat spot, or the road, some of the roadbeds that run, they're mm -hmm. real long and narrow. Stuff like that is kind of what I look for in 16 to 20 foot with some drops on both sides, but. What, what, what's your deal that you kind of key on when you get back out there? They look for the best ambush areas to feed on them shad. They don't like yeah. to work hard. Right. And stuff like that, you know, drops, ups and downs like you're talking yeah. about. They sit right on that edge. When them shad come through, they right. hit it and they have to come up over it. And the fish sit right there. Right. So basically you're looking for them ambush points. But, but probably the best advice I give them for this fall when they get deep is fish the wind. It's the windy bank Boy. where that wind's blowing in on them points, them deep points. Yeah. It just gangs them up so much better. And if you fish the flat side of the lake, you know, the calm side, they don't gang up like that. Right. And, but you get on that windy side, that's where they're at. Which usually, in Texas, <laughs> in the fall, wind's not an issue. It's blowing one direction or the get other wind. once we get into that cooling that's time right. of the year. That's right. Yeah. I, I know I've had some days out there where it's, it's waves over the bow constantly and you mm. just wear yourself a good pair of waterproof boots or go with flip flops. That's where your big spoons and tail spinners mm -hmm. and uh, that's when it comes in. Uh, moving baits work good in that wind. Yeah. That, that big spoon and, and something about it and, and, and we got the spoon man in the house yeah. right here tonight. <laughs> but but that big spoon in, in you know late October and into November, that's the time of year that I love it the most. And it you get it out there and and they're eating a lot of big bait, you know, the, them yellow bass will gang up and them gizzards yep. are out there. And all, there's a lot of big bait source out there. It all mixes together, the crappie and all that. And that big spoon just gets down there and looks like some type of bait just flopping around like it can't get right. And they yep. try to, I guess they try to get it right. Yep. <laughs> it's good. That's and a I probably spot. fish a spoon a lot different than a lot of people do. Uh -huh. A lot of people hop it, you know, yeah. hop it. I just throw it out and let it go to the bottom. Yeah. And I'll put my rod at about a 45 degree angle mm -hmm. and all I'll do is crank it five cranks and then stop like it's and let up. it fall on a tight line it just kind of flutters a little oh. slower and sometimes it seems to key them better yeah uh, and you can catch them hopping that thing but I catch so much more just, just letting it fall on a tight line yeah. and it flutters slower and it seems to trigger them pretty good sometimes it's funny you say that because I don't do it exactly like that but I get pretty close and something that I do a lot to fall is I throw it out there, put it on tight line, and I actually will reel my slack up all the way down to the water, and I just raise my rod and then drop my rod. Yeah. Now, I'm letting it fall on slack. That's the difference, but a similar deal where I'm moving it six, seven feet and raising it up and then just drop it. So it's kind of a similar deal. It's yeah. pretty neat that you said that. And then another key, you know, like later in the fall when it starts getting pretty cold and mm -hmm. it gets tougher, take that, just spoon, that Joe Spade spoon, throw it out there and just drag it on the bottom. Yeah. yeah, that's what I he's told me. He's told me that many times. Go, quit fishing it so hard, son. Just drag it on the bottom. Yeah, they'll eat that thing. I love it. Stir the mud. Because when it starts getting real cold, them fish will sit right on the bottom. Yeah. And you catch them, they'll have mud on their belly. Yeah. And what they're doing, they're getting radiating heat off the earth because it's warmer right there. Yeah. That's what they're doing. How about that? The other thing you don't want to overlook is fishing it like you do your wacky worm. It, it looks like a fish is trying to swim, but is dying. Yep. Yeah. Boom, boom. Drop it. Yeah. Like I tell a lot of people, fish are kind of like a Texas rig. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just do that right there and let it hit by. Let it sit there. All of a sudden, now, a lot of times they'll hit it off the bottom. Just, boom, yep. just like a worm. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that is about, I, you know, what? <laughs> first several years I fished here, of course, you come like four if you hear about the flutter spinner. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, 
and, and for several years that I was fishing here, you know, I'd try that flutter spoon and try it, try it, try it. It just didn't really work for me. And I was over there just doing what I was told to hop it. You know, like you said, it just didn't really catch fish. I definitely hung up and lost more spoons than I caught a fish on them. <laughs> and it blew my mind when I, as I got to know Joe really good, and, and he was telling me to slow down with it, how many fish will literally come suck that chunk of metal right off the bottom? They will. It's amazing that yeah. they'll do that, but they will. You wouldn't think they would. No, they would. you wouldn't, but they will. You know, I tell people, that they're not like, people are like, man, I'm like Fort Fisher smart. like, hold on. If you ever eaten a metal hot dog, because <laughs> they, they will. <laughs> they ain't smart. We That's just right. don't always get on their page, but they mm -hmm. ain't smart. Mm -hmm. But there's just a lot of little tricks like that you learn from doing it a lot. Yeah, all the time. Sure. And like people that just come out here don't know, Yeah. they fish it wrong. And they get out there and they see the fish on the graph and then they get out there and they go to hopping it and they don't get bit. Yep. And then Mark Pack comes along and just kind of swims it up and lets it fall slow and he's yeah. catching them. Yeah. And it can be something that small. Mm -hmm. Something little bitty like that can make a big difference. It can. It yeah. can. Especially, you know, and it's, as those fish get into that fall deal offshore, they get in big schools. Yep. And they will gather up into some big schools at and some point in the fall. That's when you can really whack them. And, and a lot of times it's just about getting one to go. You, you know, get one to fire up, you can get them going. And if you're doing the wrong technique, yeah. right, the right technique comes in there and gets one of them just to lash out at it, boy, now all of a sudden you got something. And I've seen it where you, you're on a big school, mm -hmm. and if you fish that big spoon wrong, like ripping it, you'll spook them. It'll, they'll leave. Yes, they'll leave. yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, you can't be too aggressive with it. I agree 100% there. And it, I've seen it happen, too, in the summer. Usually after about June, them big fish won't hit a deep dive crankbait real good anymore. Yeah. And if you're on with a Carolina rig, someone breaks out a big crankbait, you just spook them. Yeah. It won't bite. Yeah. It, and, you know, you hear that story. People come here and they tell you, man, I, I grabbed this big school of fish on the point. We got crankbait out there and couldn't get no bites. We went back over to make sure we were on the right spot. And all the fish were gone. Yeah. Well, you run them off. Yeah. You know, that's crazy, but they do it. But when they're feeding good, it's like, doesn't matter. You can't. Yeah. I, I tell people all the time, man, bass have got an attitude. And it's like, when they make up their mind to eat, you can't stop them. I don't care what you do, how you throw, what you've done. They're going to eat when they want to eat. But, I mean, like if a shark had a bass's attitude, you couldn't swim in the ocean. Mm -hmm. Because if they were that, they'd eat everything. Oh, yeah. They eat everything they Yep. I think a lot of people confuse spoon fishing with slab fishing. Yep. And, and that's a big mistake. Right, uh, a little slab, one ounce spoon, slab spoons, people yeah, just don't, yeah. a half ounce, one yeah. ounce. Yeah. Uh, and, and when I started, I was taught to, to hop that spoon, lift it up, do yeah. big jerk. Sure. I don't do that today. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, it's a wrist thing, but I catch it. As soon as I hit the top of the hop, I'll catch it and let it down, and then I'll pick it up and I'll move it parallel. Float. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing. <laughs> He'll be sometimes you'll just be holding it, mm -hmm. and, boom, yeah. and they'll just take it away from you. Hmm. Uh, you know, it, it's a different, it's a different product. People confuse them, the spoon with the slabs, and but you fish them somewhat in the same way, right. slow and sometimes I just drive. And they're the both slab. spoons, but they're completely right. different. Yeah, completely different action and everything. The yep. one way I fish it is I walk it like you guys are talking about, but if nothing's happening, I'll burn it in like 10 feet halfway to the boat, and I'll just dump it and let it drop it for some reason. I do that in the summer a lot. For some reason, they really watch it, and then they see it fall after yeah. it's taken off, and it makes them want to just Sometimes it's like Carolina rigging. <coughs> Throw it till you can't catch them, and then you're reeling real fast, make another catch, and they'll smash it. You ever have them? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hell, I'll, I'll have them take the Carolina rig back. Yeah. About to take the rod yeah. out of my hands when you're reeling it in sometimes. It's all reading rig. what the fish are doing at the time. You know, try different things until find something that works. The thing about fishermen is they try anything to catch fish. They will. It all. If you tell them they got to jump in the water, swim around the boat three times to get them fired up, boy, they'll be people <laughs> taking a dive. <laughs> I, I would. <laughs> when, when will you go to big swim baits? You know, for me, uh, that that kind of happens from what I see. Like in in I fish those big swimmates in the fall around grass, and I want the biggest, most expensive flat that I can find that has grass because when that deal works is when that grass starts to die down. And so when that grass starts dying down, it gives me room 
to cover a lot of water with a big swim bait. So my thinking on that is a big swim bait draws fish from a big area. You know, I mean, they, there's not a bait made that will draw a fish from further away than a swim bait. And a big swim bait draws them from an even further area. So I need a lot of room. So if I go fishing that big swim bait right now and that grass is all to the surface, a lot of it's growing to the top. I just don't, those fish can't see it as good. I don't have as, I can't draw from this big area. Now when you're throwing a big swim bait, you're taking a lot of fish out of the equation. Mm -hmm. So you need a big broad area to get the most numbers of big fish that will actually follow that thing and eat it around you. So as that grass starts to die down, which usually kind of happens about the time that we start getting out <coughs> deep and that deep bite gets really at its peak, that's about when that swim bait bite gets kind of going. For me, kind of Novemberish is the deal there. Um, but when I get that grass down, man, I'll just take that swim bait out in the back of them grass flats and just creep it, you know, take the big weightless ones and just creep it over that grass and it'll suck them in. And the thing about big swim baits that, you know, is kind of a deal that you can kind of help you clue in whether or not it's a good day to throw a big swim bait is really just listen to the fish. They'll tell you because whether they bite it or not, if they're going to bite it that day, you know, it's not, you can throw a big swim bait for a long time without getting a bite and still throw it and maybe catch a giant because it's a one-two bite deal sometimes. Mm -hmm. But if they're going to bite it, they'll follow it. If you're going to get a bite that day, it won't take you long to see one behind it. If you don't at least see, you know, like a curious four-pounder or something coming with it within the first 30, 40 minutes of throwing a swim bait, it's probably not the day for a big swim bait. That's kind of what I've seen over, over my time throwing it. But if you can see one follow up pretty quick, just keep it in your hands. It'll pay off. You'll catch a giant at some point. So. Yep. Um, and then the hard baits, the glide baits, the single-jointed hard baits that we like to throw in the fall, that directly correlates to a jerk bait. If you're out there catching them on a jerk bait, Pick up a glide bait. You'll catch fewer, but you'll catch bigger. Yeah. So. Answer. Yeah, pretty much. Are you fishing the big swim baits deep in the winter time? I do. I fish some deep. Uh, and one of the biggest keys that I've learned fishing them deep is I use a lot of those soft plastic ones. Uh -huh. But the key to it is using a real heavy weight on okay. a jig head. I'll use a two ounce. Something that hits hard when it hits. Yeah. I don't know what it does to trigger them, but it, it'll trigger them to bite it. Because the way I fish it, I just kind of slow roll it and then stop it. And it hits the, the ground. I guess it kicks up a puff of smoke. I don't know, dust. Huh. But I'm telling you, that, that'll that key them to bite Also, it. that probably makes it, when you stop it and it falls, it makes it tail. Yeah, real hard. they eat that thing when it, you got to I use like a two ounce wow. to do it. So you use an ocean net to catch 80 pound ops. And yeah. you use ocean jig heads on big swim. Right. <laughs> <laughs> hey, back, hey, back in the day, man, I bet it was 25 years ago, maybe 30. Mm. I used to buy these 10 inch sassy sheds they used up there on the stripers and mm -hmm. had the text on them. Mm -hmm. And that's where I learned to, and I'd get them. First, I tried a one ounce jig head and we'd catch a few. And I ran out and I had some two ounce. And dude, I started crushing them on that thing. Mm. On that big sassy shed, Boy. out deep. That was the that was the beginning notations. You didn't even know it of the right. impact shed. That's right. It? That's right. Sounds <laughs> like a big chatter bait with a finesse fish on it. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. But a lot of times you learn things just by doing different things. You know, trying different things out. You know, that's one thing about that probably makes this sport so great is there's just no absolutes. Uh -uh. You know, there's no wrong necessarily wrong thing. I mean. They do have a pea-sized brain. They are not smart. They will eat a big, giant chunk of hubcap metal. And there's all kinds of things that'll work. And it's, you're never necessarily wrong for trying something. I mean, you never know. And a lot of times I learn stuff from my customers just doing different things. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> you Keep do learn life. stuff. Yeah. <laughs> well, you do. Absolutely. Well, we may do a short one or not, Pac. Man, that, yeah. that was a... Uh, you start talking about that prime rib over I know, nobody wants to talk about fishing when I want to eat. That's right. I'm a professional eater. <laughs> yeah, I know you are. <laughs> <laughs> All right, go ahead. The, the Berkeley tournament's coming up. Uh-huh. Do, do any of you guys have any available slots for people that might be interested in getting a guide beforehand? When is it? October 20th. I think I've got maybe four or five days left open. Yeah. We can get you a guide. If anybody out there is looking for a guide, call me, call Mark. If we happen to be booked that day, we'll set you up with somebody that'll take good care of you for sure. Because there's a one thing I like for there's a bunch of good guys. Oh, yeah. There's a bunch of good fishing going on out here. There's a bunch of good fishermen. A bunch of them. You know what I've told people? What's that? They ask me if certain people are good guys. Let's just say, hey, there's no such thing as a good guy. 
Some are just better than others. They're like attorneys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a fair point. That's a good one. Yeah. That's right. Some are just better than others, right? That, that's 100%. <laughs> I, I can go along with that all day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what brand of two ounce jig head are you talking about using? The one I use is made by owner. It's like a saltwater uh, jig head. I, ocean gear. It's got a big O owner hook <laughs> in it. And it's just a big O. It looks similar to a, it's kind of round, rounded nose and it's flat on the back where your swim bait goes up against it. Uh, but it's made by owner. Like a 10 off, 8 off. It's got a big hook in it. Probably an most eight, of the, 8 to a 10. Yeah, most of those are an 8 or a 10 on yeah, the 1 ounce or bigger. That's what I use. Yeah. It's an owner. Now, on your swim bait on that big jig head, and are you uh, using those big hollow bellies? What, what kind of swim bait is it? Is it a solid body, wide tail wag, or is Man, it a I use bear? different things. Do you? Yeah, I'll use. A lot of times I use a lot of those they use in the spring, you know, that have that weighted, that line through. Oh, the, yeah, like the line through stuff. Yeah, but I make mine in my garage. I got just a mold of it. Yeah. Just where you don't put that weight in there. You just pour it solid. Yeah. And just. Put the jig head in. So like a seven inch or so. <coughs> yeah, that's good. That's good. Oh, I just wondered if there was a different <coughs> tail action specific to the winter time. Because I know in the summertime, you know, most guys throw the uh, hollow boats Usually on the I like a, heads. I don't like a big wide deal. You know, pretty about a medium wobble. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, but the most important, like I said, is that way. It yeah. well, sometimes we get tied up on that swim bait. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that like in the springtime, whenever I fish some big swim bait shallow, mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure you can put a line through treble hook on a Snickers bar. Yeah. If you can make it swim slow enough, you can catch them. Yeah. Because I mean, when they get to biting something that big, if it's moving, if it's big and it's moving in the water, they're going to eat it. Yeah. You know. And, and so probably the same deal on jig. As long as it's got something kicking back there, it probably wouldn't be all that. And a lot of times, good. like like you know, I fish in the summer. I fish my impacts. You had the big one weightless. Yeah. And I do it a lot in the winter time too. Do you? Fishing it slow, just twitching it and killing it. Suspended fish, you mark suspended fish on the graph well, when you're doing the No, that or? time when they're on the bottom, I fish it. You get it down to the bottom and fish it. And like, wow. Just like it, Joe did with that spoon, right. you fish it slow. Huh. That's one I've never heard of. It's kind of like a worm. Because I, I know, like, the summer deal is mostly yeah. suspended fish. Yeah. You see them on your graph yeah. suspended, yeah. set up on them, count it down. I do that a lot in the winter, too. How, how, do, you get, how do you keep it down there? Do you use big hook. Big hook? Yeah. Okay. Weight is hook. And just you gotta be patient to get yeah. down there. Yeah. Oh, now if the wind's blowing hard that day, you're probably not gonna do that. I use about a seven knot. But you are using a weighted hook. No, when I said weighted hook, I didn't mean weighted oh. hook. I mean just a heavy hook that's weighted. You know, big, big heavy I mean. gauge. And, seven and it'll stay down. I use a, I use usually a trocar six knot, uh -huh. the EWG, the big bike. Yeah. That it it takes a while to get down there. It follows about six inches per second. So if you're in 30 foot, it's going to take you a minute. <laughs> they're not, they're not, most fishermen are not patient enough no. to let it go down to the hey, bottom. Listen, Pack, if I ever get on a boat with you and we're doing that, well, I'm I've learned it some through experience. Here. You'll throw out there and just maybe have to go to the bathroom or get you a drink. Yeah, I'm bringing the cooler full of cold beer. You know, and, and then the, <laughs> there's fish on there. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. That's how I learned to fish low sometimes. Yeah. Just fish it low. But that's how I fish that chat a lot. You know what, for years, before I caught my first 10-pound fish that I ever caught, for years, my personal best was 9 pounds, 9 ounces mm -hmm. for a long time. And my wife takes full credit for this because I was out fishing <laughs> after work one day, years ago, and she called me to talk to me on the way home from work. And I had just worm fishing, you know, but throwing it out there. And she called me, and so I just pushed the button, stripped the line, pulled the pipe on. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah, I know I'm in trouble like always, I get it, yeah, I'm the worst husband, I understand. Oh, hey, I gotta go. <laughs> he was swimming off with just uh -huh. sitting on the bottom, man. That was the biggest fish I caught for years. A lot of times, the fish trying to tell you something, tell you to slow down. That's yeah. the number one thing I tell my customers. Oh, I mean, they gotta slow down. Yeah. Especially out deep. You just gotta slow down. You fish fishing too fast, especially in the heat of summer. Yeah. They start fishing too fast, you ain't gonna catch them. Yeah, and when, when that bite gets tough up, you know, I spend a lot more time in shallow than you do. I, I spend a lot more time in shallow than most guys, but when that bite gets tough up shallow, that's one of the deals to catch the better fish up shallow when the bite does get tough is the same deal. I mean, same principle. 
but you got to slow down, and you'll put that wacky worm or even a light Texas rig on, and they want to throw it out there and hop it and mm-hmm. make it dance in the grass. Mm-hmm. And it looks cool when it's beside the boat doing that. And I'm like, mm, no, stop. Yeah. Throw it out there and just let it see it, mm-hmm. and, and you just have to slow down. Well, I agree 100%. Well, if you're in a hurry to catch one, you ain't going to catch one. You're going to miss your chance. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Can't force it. Let's slow down, and you'll catch more. All right. Any more questions? Any more answers? I think we're all out of answers. Everybody wants to get some prime ribs, so let's go do that. We got Mr. Ken Donahue, the owner of Lake Fork Marine Back. Appreciate you joining us, and thank you for giving us this great facility to do these, and we really appreciate it. Sir. Our pleasure. Yes, sir. Mark, Enjoyed thank it, you man. very much. Guys that are watching out there, is it, what, what's your website, Mark Pack? MarkPackLakeFork.com. MarkPackLakeFork.com. Look him up. Check him out. He won't tell you. He won't admit it. He won't own up to it, but this dude's a legend. He's a legend. I'm telling you. Look him up. Book a trip. He's awesome. Thank you all for watching. Thank you guys for joining us tonight. And we'll see you all next time right here on your Lake Road Guide.